Just stretch your hands out towards me. Lord, thank you for this opportunity today. Father, may every one of us hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And Father, may you confirm the word of God with signs following in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to steal the title of of this particular lesson from Pastor Larry Stockstill. He did a lesson many years ago called The Pace of Grace. And I felt led to minister to this to some pastors that I've been teaching, and I wanted to share this with you as well, because if you have a heart to serve Jesus, how many of you know there are so many options for us? There are so many things that we can do. And I see one of two extremes. I see people that say, oh, I'm just too busy to do anything for Jesus. And let me just say, if you're too busy to do anything for Jesus, you're too busy. Because we're here on the earth to be about the Father's business. In fact, Jesus said, I am busy about the Father's business. So you've got some that really don't get involved. They say, I don't have time. Maybe when I get older, I'll do that, whatever the case might be. And then others that feel like they have to do everything. And we've all been there before. We all have a heart to serve the Lord. But we have to find out, God, what are you calling me to do? Now, there are many major well-known characters in the Bible. We read about people like Abraham and Sarah, Ruth and David, Isaiah, Peter, and Paul. There is much in the Bible about these amazing men and women. But there are other people who are very godly, but who play a much smaller role in Scripture. And yet their life is one that we can look at and we can learn from. One of those men is found in Philippians chapter number 2. His name is Epaphroditus. Say that with me. Epaphroditus. Hereafter, he may just be called Epi. So if I'm talking about Epi, you know who I mean. On Paul's second missionary journey, he and his team went to Philippi. And he planted a church in that city. We know that because Acts 16 tells us the story. He met a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. She and some others came to the Lord. They got water baptized. And from that, Paul began a church. Eventually, he planted that church and then left. And Dr. Luke, the writer of Luke and Acts, apparently stayed behind and continued the work in this newly established church. Now, many years later, Paul was detained, and he was placed under house arrest in Rome. When the Philippians heard that Paul was in prison, they sent Epaphroditus, or Epi, and had had him deliver a care package in the form of supplies to Paul. This offering helped to meet his physical needs. Now, if you go down to the Pittsburgh jail, it's not a great environment, but you've got great meals, you've got television, you've got gyms, you've got basketball courts. It wasn't that way in a Roman prison or even under house arrest. So Paul sent Epaphroditus home with the newly penned letter to the Philippians, we call it the book of Philippians. Now, when you come to chapter number two, Paul is teaching the importance of servanthood. And he gives us four different examples. In verses five through 11, we have Paul speaking about Jesus Christ as the ultimate servant. In verses 12 through 18, Paul himself describes him him being a servant. Paul himself. Verses 19 through 24, he speaks of Timothy as a servant. And then in verses 25 through 30, we have the story of Epaphroditus. Now, we know a lot about Jesus and Paul and Timothy, but very little is mentioned about Epaphroditus today. He is mentioned in two different passages in Philippians, chapter 2 
in chapter 4 and verse number 18. Now, let's take a look at Philippians 2. And you might want to turn in your Bible if, in fact, you bring your Bible or access it on your phone. But there are six verses that talk about this man by the name of Epaphroditus. Really, the book of Philippians could be called a thank you note from Paul to the saints in Philippi for their generous gifts. He was in prison, he was alone, under house arrest, and they sent Epaphroditus to him to minister to his needs. Now, Paul speaks very highly of Epi. Look at verse 25. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. Now notice what he calls Epaphroditus. A true brother in Christ, a co-worker in the gospel, a fellow soldier in the army of God, and their apostle. How do you know he was an apostle? That word messenger is the Greek word apostolos. We get the English word apostle from that. So he said you were their apostle, or he was your apostle. And so he speaks very highly of this man of God who came to minister to his needs. But then let's continue in verse 26. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed because you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him, Epaphroditus, and also on me, Paul, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So Paul said, Epaphroditus was very sick. We weren't sure whether he was going to make it. But God gave us mercy. Mercy on you, you have him back, and mercy on me. I did not lose a man that I love. So notice the first sorrow there that Paul talked about was that he was in prison, he was under house arrest, and he was, he was trapped there. He could not leave. Now, he was able to preach the gospel there, but he wasn't, wasn't able to leave and go to the churches and minister. So that was Paul's first sorrow. He said, I don't want to have sorrow upon sorrow, so God had mercy on me. The second sorrow was that Epaphroditus could have died from this severe illness. But he said, God had mercy on me. Now, we should not push ourselves to the point of exhaustion or burnout, but we can learn something about Epaphroditus about the importance of sacrifice in the Christian life. And I can feel the love right there. Woo! Preach it, Pastor. Here's the reality. To many Americans, sacrifice is going to church when it's hot out or when it's raining. But sometimes we don't recognize what other believers have to do in different countries. And I did some research about this, and I found this to be very, very interesting. We'll talk more about this in just a moment. Epaphroditus was an amazing example of sacrifice and dedication, and really we are to honor and appreciate people like that. So listen to me. There is no criticism with me in this story. But there are some things that we can learn from Epaphroditus' life. Again, he was so sick he almost died, but God healed him. Now, how sick was he? This is interesting. The Greek language tells us how close he was to death. He was just next door. You may have a next door neighbor. Oh, where does Joey live? Oh, he's just next door. He was that close to dying. Verse 27 says, he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. I have a Greek scholar I love to read after, Kenneth Weiss. He's a Baptist Greek scholar. And he says, the original Greek says this, he and death were next door neighbors. So he was very sick. 
In fact, he translates this verse, For truly Epi was ill next door to death. So it seems that overwork was the possible case for his physical trouble. I am sure that traveling all the way from Philippi to Rome would have been a very strenuous trip. In fact, listen to this. Epaphroditus would have traveled around 730 miles round trip to be with Paul. 730 miles. Now, he did not take an airplane. He did not get into a car. He either walked or he took a boat when he came to the sea. 730 miles, and one scholar said that the voyage would have taken about two months in all. So he could have left in January and come back in March. So it wasn't like he was going across town to go and see Paul. He was traveling hundreds of miles through all different conditions and terrains, and that's probably why he struggled so. But notice verse number 28. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be worried about you. Welcome him with Christian love and with great joy. Notice this phrase, and give him the honor that people like him deserve. How many of you know that one thing that's greatly lacking in the West is the principle of of honor. And if you get on YouTube, you can see a lot of criticism. Any major preacher has people criticizing them for anything and everything. And there may be some valid times where someone does something they shouldn't do. But here's what the Bible says. If someone brings you the good news, their feet are beautiful. So we need to walk in that principle of honor for those that sacrifice to bring us the gospel of Jesus Christ and give him the honor that people like him deserve for he risked his life for the work of Christ and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Now, another translation says this, he came close to death not regarding his life. That phrase means to gamble, to expose your life. Again, Kenneth Weiss says not regarding is a term used in gambling circles. It means he was reckless. I commend him for wanting to take care of Paul. I'm not criticizing that. But if we are not careful, sometimes, and I'm not saying he did this, but we can get into areas that are not our particular anointing or call. And so it's important for us to say, God, I want to do everything you've called me to do, but if you're not in it, I don't want to be involved in it. It might be a need, it might be legitimate, but I may not be the one to meet that need. God does not call us to work for him to the point of physical or emotional harm. Do you believe that? God doesn't, I could use a little bit of feedback here. God doesn't call us to work for him to the point of physical or emotional harm. I've heard people say, well, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Well, the good news is we don't have to do either one. We don't have to rust out because of inactivity, and we don't have to burn out because we're doing too much. I think we've learned something from previous generations where many of them died very young because they would just go and push and did not walk in the pace of grace. And so if we learn this principle, it can make a big difference in our lives. I know one of the things is delegating to others, not just doing it all. D.L. Moody said, it is better to put 10 men to work than to try to do the work of 10 men. Now, let's just bring this down to our everyday lives. I know that things are challenging in our culture right now, financially and other ways, lots of demands, lots of pressure. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, In the last days there will be perilous times 
The Greek says times of stress. Are any of us living in times of stress right now? Yeah, we're seeing that all around us. How do we manage all of that? Let's talk about a balanced life. Jesus dealt with this when they were in ministry together with the disciples, when he was preaching, ministering. They had crowds that were huge. He would be exhausted. So one time Jesus said in Mark 6, 31, come aside, or one translation, come apart by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So I'm sure the disciples were ministering, praying for the sick, casting out demons. They skipped breakfast. They skipped lunch. They were just too busy because of the demands of the people. So Jesus stopped and said, come apart and rest a while. Someone said this, come apart and rest. If you don't come apart and rest, you will simply come apart. You see, you cannot break natural laws and expect to live in health. We burn out when we add to God's plan for our lives. We burn out when we add to the plan of God. I know this, because of doing a lot of ministry in Pakistan right now, when other Pakistanis see us ministering, we work with three different churches, and and as we do that, we have had literally, I get them almost every day, every day, people asking us to come, come brother, and preach with us, and work with us, and help us, and I've probably had a hundred orphanages with people sending me information, and My heart breaks because I realize the need is so great. And honestly, if we had a billion dollars, we probably could not meet all of the need. So it's really important to say, God, who are you connecting us with? Who are those divine connections? There are good connections, but then there are those God connections connections. And so it's important to say, Lord, we want to be busy about the Father's business, but we don't want to do something under guilt or pressure alone. There was a pastor by the name of John, and he was complaining about burnout, complaining about exhaustion. And the Lord spoke to him and said this, John, it's not your calling that's nearly killing you. It's everything you've added to it. It's the adding on that gets us in trouble. One person said this, there are two things every person in ministry needs to learn to say, no and thank you. Say those with me, no and thank you. I realize that we work primarily in a volunteer ministry. Those who serve here, most of them don't get paid. They're serving, they're giving their time, their energy. And a lot of times, all they want is, thank you. We appreciate it. It means so much. Don't take people for granted. And then as my mother-in-law so well said, no is a complete sentence. Look at me, smile real big, and say, come on, Kathy, help me out, say, Come on, one more more time, Kathy. Let me hear you. Yeah, no is a complete sentence. That's good, yeah. And so I know in our role as we've got older, it's important just to say, Lord, if you say no, I'll say no. If you say yes, I'll say yes. Numbers 22, 18, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Some people do less than they should. Many do more than they should. But the prophet said, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do less or more. Now, it's easier to say this than to do it, but do only what God has called you to do. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And this is important as well because I've been to 
about 25 countries, some of them several times, and in almost every country I go to, the fruit is so great, I'll say, God, maybe I just need to move to Africa or move to Brazil or move to wherever. But here's what I realize. A need is not necessarily a call. A burden is not necessarily a call. It doesn't mean you can't go one time and be a blessing, but before you sell the shop and pack your bags, make sure you've heard from heaven. Again, there is obviously a need, but are you the one to meet that need? Now, the answer could be yes, but you need to have a clear word from heaven. I remember being in India and driving for hours past the masses of humanity with great need. And I said, God, do you want us to, to move to India and just meet that need? But I realized a burden alone is not a call. We need that direct message from heaven if we make that move. And a need is not necessarily a call. Jesus understood how to say no and to set boundaries in his ministry. Now, he went the extra mile. He would minister to the masses. He would preach all day long at times with no rest, not even eating. But notice this, Luke 12, 13, and 14. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, this to me sounds like a lawyer issue. Jesus was a preacher, not a lawyer. And so he's asking Jesus, Jesus, we've got this issue over here. Now let me ask you, if you feel you're being ripped off in an estate, is that a legitimate issue? Yes. But Jesus responded by saying this, friend, who made me a judge over you or the two of you to decide things as such, or uh, such things as this. In other words, Jesus was saying, it might be legitimate, it might be a need, but I'm not the one to meet that particular need. Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So there's three things I see about this. Number one, Jesus knew what he was, and what he was not called to do. Now that takes time. You don't learn that overnight. But he knew, this is my lane. This is not my lane. Jesus did not allow people to pull him away from his calling. Number two, Jesus set boundaries in his life and ministry. He did not do what this man wanted him to do. He stayed in his lane. And then number three, Jesus used this question as a teaching moment. He taught this man and the crowd about greed and proper priorities. I know I've had, especially as you get older, you get kind of a reputation. I was noticing the other day, I did a funeral, and I asked, Laurie, how many funerals have I done? And she said, 88 funerals. It's a lot of funerals. I've done about that many weddings. And with a wedding, if they're Bereans, it's a great event. But I used to do outside weddings in the desire to maybe bring them into church. Well, if I, if I get married, Pastor, then we'll be in church. Well, that never, ever, ever happens. And so for all the weddings I would do, I would give up a Friday night and half a day Saturday every time I did one. And I would have people, I have funeral directors, you do such a great job with services, would you be on call to do funeral services? I said, no, that, that's just not my, what I'm called to do. If someone's retired and has the time, that's fine. But as you get skilled at something, people can put on those demands and you've got to say, Lord, what are you in and what are you not in? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. I want to make sure I'm doing what I'm called to do. We are called to pastor this church and to preach the word. 
We are called to minister right now in Pakistan and a few other places. I'm called to be on hard questions on Cornerstone Television. Outside of that, I try to be sensitive to say, God, I don't want to be involved if you're not in it. Now, let me give you another example of a time when Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit, but not pressured by people or circumstances. Luke 4, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. I don't know about you, but if I had people begging me to stay, I'd probably say, yeah, that's good. They like me. I want to stay. But he said, I'm not called to that. I'm called to evangelize as well. I'm here now, but I'm called to keep preaching the gospel to city after city. So notice that Jesus did not do what they asked him to do. Why? He was listening to the Father's voice in what he was to do and in when he was to do it. Now, some people have a hard time saying no, and they take on too much. On the other hand, some don't do much at all. But everyone should be serving in their local church in some capacity. It doesn't have to be one or the other. How many of you ever ever heard of a church in Tulsa called Victory Christian Center? Great church, well-known, right across the street from Oral Roberts University. It was founded by an apostolic pastor, and his name was, um, Dougherty was his last name, Billy Joe Dougherty, and his wife's name was Sharon, and they had a large, large church, and she wrote something that I thought was so good. This is worth listening to closely. She talked about balance, and she said, another area that the enemy would try to condemn you is when you hear different ministries speak and challenge you to be involved in areas of Christian ministry. And then she said, and see if you can relate. Over the years, I've heard soul winners preach on winning 10 people a week to Christ. Intercessors who exhort to pray two or three hours a day. Bible teachers who teach that you should memorize and study the Bible at least two hours a day. Marriage and family ministers who speak on being at home and fulfilling all the household, mother, and wife duties. Women speakers who share on being creative at home and making all your home decor. Christian political leaders who share on taking a political stand in your community. Ministers who exhort on being actively involved in the church as a teacher or youth or children's leader. Prison ministries who exhort on the scripture, I was in prison and you visited me and other areas. And then she said this, after all these inspiring messages, I would feel so drained thinking all I had to do and all I hadn't done and I was almost ready to throw in the towel. Has anyone been there before? Don't raise your hand. I would work hard after each teaching to be a doer of the word. Then I'd become overwhelmed. I came to the realization that what was most important for my life was finding what God wanted me to do and doing it. That is good. Finding your place, your lane, God's call in your life. Jesus went the extra mile to minister to others, but he also dismissed the crowds to get alone and be renewed. I know in my own life there are times I just know I've hit a wall with pressure, with demands, and you just need to pull back, relax, have some fun time. So just a couple of practical things. If you're going and blowing all the time, take some time for yourself. 
Now, my happy place is the gym. Just looking at me, that's obvious to all of you. I realize that. Yeah, thank you, my nephew. Read a book. Exercise. Enjoy a hobby. Do something to unwind and relax. Jerry Savelle used to say that Oral Roberts taught him, take some time just to read a, a fiction book, something just to get your mind off of other things, whatever it is for you, but it's good to be busy about the Father's business, but you need those times to unwind, rest, and recharge your batteries. There was a well-known professional bodybuilder by the name of Bill Pearl, and he said something interesting. He said, I give the world 22 hours a day, but I will not give it 24. That's good. I give the world 22 hours a day, but I will not give it 24. Now you might say, Pastor, I've got little kids. I can't take two hours for myself, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever the case might be. But you need to carve out some time to work out, to read, to rest. Come apart and rest is what Jesus said. said. Otherwise, you just come apart. This is wise counsel. Take a little bit of time each day for yourself and some extended time each week to renew your batteries. In a crazy, busy world, let's choose to walk in the pace of grace. And let's make the decisions to adjust our schedule accordingly. You see, when you follow God's plan for your life, he will never push you to the point of utter exhaustion and burnout or physical harm. I was trained under Kenneth Hagin, as Pastor Stephanie was, and he would tell us of prior generations where men would work 20, 30, 40 hours straight, no work, uh, I'm sorry, no sleep, no rest, no anything, and they would hit a wall and have to take months and months off just to get back to a place of health. Sometimes they damage their bodies. Sometimes they damage their spiritual lives. And he taught us about pacing yourself. I believe it's a lot better to have a long, fruitful life than to be a shooting star. There is a pace of grace that God has for you. Amen and amen. Could we stand together? Just get quiet for a second. Maybe we can put on something quiet, Wendy. Just ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything I'm not doing that I should be? Is there anything I am doing that I should not be? Father, speak to our hearts. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor, but we labor in vain. Father, yes, we want to be about the Father's business, but we want to be doing what you have called us to do. So, Lord, right now, I speak rest to the people of God. I speak wisdom to the people of God. And, Lord, direct us. What is our call? What is our lane? Father, we want to fulfill that with everything within us. But we do not want to add to your plan for our lives. Holy Spirit, you live within us. Speak, guide, and direct us to exactly what you've called us to do and called us to be. We want to fulfill our assignment under heaven, but we do not want to add to it. A burden, a need is not a call. Thank you, Father, for clarity, 
Thank you for direction. And Father, we choose to walk in the pace of grace. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. I hope that helped you today.